Dear Lord, we again thank you for this day and all that you've given us. We thank you for the joy of being able to worship together as your family. We thank you, Lord God, that you give us a day in our week to come together and worship you. And yet, Lord God, we know that we need more. We need to be filled by you, and I pray for this message that's about to come from my lips, this meditation from my heart, Lord God, that it might be pleasing in your sight. And in asking that, Lord, I ask also that you not let these words be mine, but, Lord, that you speak through me and that your words go out and not return to you empty. I ask this, Lord, for you are a rock and you are a one true redeemer. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And guys, if you could go ahead and play that video. Yes. punchline okay with technical difficulty the way it ends the grandfather who's holding that baby there starts to lift up takes a whiff and starts to hand the baby to mom and the mom just hands diaper says you got this <laughs> but grace be to you from God our eternal father and from Jesus Christ our eternal savior now hopefully most of you can relate to at least some of those scenes there um, quite frankly, I think that those are words that most of us crave to hear. Um, in fact, it can be quite amazing how those simple, assuring words can impact each of us. Those, uh, those assuring words that let us know that you got this, um, especially when it's our eternal Father who's saying those words to us. But... A lot of time when a parent speaks those words to us, they, our parents will speak it to us because they know that we know the information. They know that we have this skill. They know that we know the right way to behave because more often than not, parents, we have taught that information to our children in the first place. But I want to jump into our gospel reading for today. Now, in our gospel reading from, uh, from St. Luke's kind of the gospel, St. Uh, chapter 8, uh, prior, just prior to this, the G, uh, Jesus had done more miracles out on the great body of water, and so the disciples have witnessed his power. And yet, when Jesus' disciples, they land in the country of the Gerasenes, and they run into a, for one person immediately upon landing. 
And that is a man that we find out he has a nickname. He has a nickname that comes with a stigma. And that man's nickname is Legion. But he has this name because of a whole host of demons who have taken up residency living inside of him. And these demons have made this man do all sorts of things. They have made him run without clothes. They have made him sleep amongst the tombs. People of the city had tried to bind him with chains and shackles. And the texts tell us that that this man, through the power of the demon in him, had actually broken those metal shackles and chains. And so this guy comes running up to Jesus. And I imagine the apostles at this point see him, and they're cowering behind Jesus, kind of looking over his shoulder. And the first words out of this man's mouth are, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. Now here's the thing, when when we hear these words, what have you to do with me, the literal Greek to English translation is this, it is, what to me is also to you. And I read that and I realized something. And that, and that was that, the fact that it must have been Jar Jar Binks who was speaking to us at that point. For those who don't get that's a little bit of Star Wars humor there. But Professor Arndt suggests there is a better, more modern day translation for this. And he says the, probably the more modern translation would be, why do you not leave me alone? And so if we follow this translation of why do you not leave me alone, we have a little bit of an ambiguity problem going on here. And I say this because it's, most of us have grown up with the idea that is the demons who are speaking at this point. And yet there is another theory out there. And that is the theory that the demons were actually allowing this man to speak And so that brings up a a question that we need to address of who is doing the talking. Now again, most of us who are familiar with this, we probably have grown up thinking it is the demon. But the simple fact is, we don't know. There is that possibility that the demons were allowing this to happen. But let's take a moment and look at this. So if the demons were the ones doing the talking here, they would have been asking the question of why do you not leave me alone because... It's a plea. It's a plea from the demons. And yet Jesus hasn't come to leave evil alone. Jesus doesn't leave the demons alone because he's come to destroy evil in all of its forms. He has come to restore creation. Remember, Jesus came to die on a cross the third day rose from the dead to feed sin, death, and the devil so that those would have no more power over his children. And yet we need to also consider the possibility, even though it's ever so slight, that it might be the man who's doing the talking. And if it is the man who's doing the talking, why would he ask the question of why do you not leave me alone? Well, a good part of that is probably because he was a Gentile. And there before him, stood a Jewish rabbi. And the Jews were known to think lowly of Gentiles. We hear one, one of the texts where, uh, how Gentiles were sometimes called uh, dogs. Jews had a reputation of not being that kind to those who weren't like them. And as I say that, much hasn't changed through the centuries, has it, with the church I remember hearing a story several years back about some people from this one church. They um, they had a gay pride parade in their area that was coming up, and so they decided they were going to go down and witness to those people. And they came up with the idea that they would go buy uh, cases of water. They bought about 20 cases of water. The day came to go down there. They went, and it actually... The worst that happened is that when people found out where they were from and what they were doing, the conversation ended. The best thing that happened for them was that they were able to actually pray 
with some of the people and build a relationship so they could further the conversation. And yet they tell, as a part of the story, that there was a sad note. That as one of the, these people who had gone down there that day to share God's love, they looked across the street at this in, intersection and the car had pulled up. And as the person he had been talking to also saw this car pull up, the person who was at actually attending, who was there for the parade, said, great, it's another one of those. And so this person from the church watched as this nervous person in the car rolled down his window an inch or two. And then he watched as he threw out several Bible tracts out of his window and then quickly drove away. This person who was afraid to even come in contact with the people who were there for the parade. And sadly, for a lot of the unchurched world, that's how they view those of us on the inside of these four walls. That we should never want to be, get near anyone who isn't willing to come inside. Some people even say that if they don't come to church, that's their own fault. But the truth is, that we are all sinners in need of a savior. And God, truth be told, has every right to leave us and abandon us to our sin, to our pride, to our arrogance. And while it's true that Jesus spent a lot of his time in the temple preaching, he also spent a lot of his time outside of that temple as well, telling about God's love, going out, getting his hands dirty, sharing his love with those outside who so desperately need it. And I dare say that the last time I checked, Jesus was supposed to be our example to follow. Well, several years back, there was an, uh, pub, uh, the publication Focus on the Family. Some of you probably have heard of that before. And they published this story about a disabled boy. We'll call him Jeff. And I wanted to share an excerpt with you. Uh, this story says, the greatest obstacle to being a handicapped or challenged or disabled or whatever label we might be using this year is not the condition, but rather the stigma that society still associates with it. Several years ago, Jeff played in a special little league for kids with disabilities. And after many seasons of watching from the bleachers and rooting while his big brother played ball, Jeff's opportunity finally arrived. And when he received his uniform, he couldn't wait to get home to put it on. And he raced out from his bedroom, fully suited up. He announced to me, Mom, now I'm a real boy. I get a little bit clumped when I hear that. Though his words pushed my heart to my throat, I assured him he had always been a real boy. It's interesting how so many people let what we perceive to be our worth define us. That we let the outside world put definitions on us, and yet at the same time we also put definitions on those who are on the outside. And that's not what defines us. See, in today's reading from Paul's letters to the Galatians, we heard a lot about how each of us were at one time captive and imprisoned under the law. And yet there's a weird part about this, because the way Paul tells us this is, he tells us that the law was also our guardian. And so you've got this weird sort of thing going on, saying, well, it's here to protect you, but it's also here to, to, to put you into chains. And we're, so we're being held captive by the same guardian. The law was supposed to keep us from sinning, yet the law at the same time also accuses us of those very same sins. And that's quite the stigma for us to have to bear. I mean, who wants to have the identity of being a lawbreaker? Who wants to have the identity of somebody who just goes out and breaks God's laws? I know for several companies I used to work for, if you put in an application and when you got to that line where it said, do you have a criminal record, that if you checked yes, 
your application was almost definitely just going to be dropped into the trash because no one wanted to hire someone who had been a criminal or who had been to jail what a stigma to bear to, to know that the stigma is going to follow you wherever you go even if that isn't who you are anymore and I think a lot of us do that with ourselves and sometimes we do that to other people as well and yet Paul tells us verse 24 of the letter to the Galatians he says so then the law was our guardian and notice this next word until the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Justification, again, means being made right. And that faith that you have, not something that you create, that faith that you have, it comes from hearing the word. And we know this, we know this because when Jesus died on the cross and three days later rose from the dead, that he defeated sin, death, and the devil so that they would have no power over anyone who calls Jesus Lord. And if the law was what pointed out our sin, and sin is what enslaved us, well then what? And Paul has that answer. A little bit later in Paul's letter to the Galatians, he tells us chapter 4, verse 7, So you are no longer a slave, but you rather you are a son, and if a son, then you are an heir you are an heir through God and this isn't because you have done something but it's because of what Christ has done to you out of his love for you Christ frees you from the bonds of sin he frees you from the stigma of sin because you are not defined by it but you rather you are defined by Christ in the gospel lesson for today, after, after the, Jesus frees the possessed man from his enslavement to the demons, and the demons go to the herds of the pig, the pigs run up the cliff, and the pig herders go out to the city, there is some loss of time in the text. And we don't know exactly what happened between the herdsmen going off and come and bring the city back, people back. All we know is that when they do come back, they find this once possessed man who was in bondage. They find him clothed and sitting calmly by Jesus. And a little bit after that, Jesus gets up to leave, and the newly freed man, he begs Jesus to let him go with him. But Jesus tells the man to go home and to tell everybody how much God had done for him. And yet... I can't help but think how during that time when the herdsmen were away that Jesus was telling the freedman how he would no longer be defined by, his, by that former possession, by his former enslavement, but rather that he was now defined as one of God's precious children that he was now defined as one who is an heir of all that God has. And so when after Jesus told him to go and share everything that God had done for him, I take a little bit of extra liberty, and I, I imagine Jesus whispering to him. I imagine Jesus whispering to the man, go on, you've got this. And my friends, that's what he says to us. See, we as God's sons and daughters, we cry out to our Abba Father. And he says back to us, you have got this. Because not only does the Holy Spirit indwell in each of us, but also because of the fact that you've been freed from our bondage to sin through the mighty works of Jesus. And not only do we get this, not only have we got this, but more importantly, he has got you. And because he has got you, we now can get this. That is our God who has freed us. 
you are no longer defined by those sins. Rather, you are defined by Christ as heirs. And it is in his precious name that each of us prays and says,